Thanks very much uh, for, uh, for inviting us um, for the first panel discussion here today. My name is Mike Livermore. I'm the Executive Director of the Institute for Policy Integrity here at NYU uh, over at the law school. And uh, I, I work in, uh, and the, the Institute's work touches on this area of valuing lives fairly uh, uh, significantly um, on a kind of day-to-day -day and practical basis. Um, as we interact with uh, uh, EPA and other federal agencies uh, as they kind of make decisions about uh, regulatory matters, and that's really what our emphasis is on. Uh, this first panel is going to focus on a paper that Steve Newbold uh, wrote and is presenting uh, in a couple of minutes. Steve's an economist with the National Center for Environmental Economics at EPA, and uh, although, you know, we've been warned that, of course, that doesn't imply any agency endorsement of anything that he's written, I will say that, um, especially in the environmental area, the NCEE really is uh, the institution in the U.S. that has the most kind of practical experience in the day-to-day -day activity of assigning value uh, to life-saving measures. And they've developed an enormous amount of expertise um, and a variety of kind of different methodological uh, approaches and, and really aggregated the kind of best practices. Uh, within the field. So um, coming from that area, Steve has a, um, a, will bring a very interesting perspective. And then the discussant is Scott Holliday. Scott works uh, at the Institute for Policy Integrity as an economics fellow. He's a, a PhD economist from the University of Colorado, and his focus is on uh, environmental economics, um, especially on the production and, and some of the um, uh, empirical uh, questions. So um, without further delay, maybe we can go ahead and get started. I don't know. Steve, do you have a presentation? I do. Okay, first, uh, many thanks to Ben and the rest of the organizers for inviting me. Um, I am going to emphasize the disclaimer again here. Um, uh, I work for the EPA, like Michael said, but I, I can't emphasize this too strongly. These are my views alone. Um, they let us out from time to time to <laughs> talk publicly about this stuff on the condition that we, we make clear that um, we don't speak for the agency. Um, I do work with a, a lot of other economists. Um, I'm not the most authoritative person on VSL and health valuation in our office. Um, and so, but I do know a little bit about this since I've um, been working on it a bit in the last couple of years. If you want more authoritative views um, of what the EPA thinks about this, you should consult these, these papers. The, the first the first paper on this slide especially um, has a lot of references to other EPA and science advisory board reports that, that ultimately, ultimately would let you piece together sort of EPA's entire history of thinking on this stuff. Um, so a quick outline first. Um, in my line of work as a quantitative environmental policy analyst, we do a lot of benefit cost analysis, so the VSL, value of statistical life, plays a, a prominent role in those. One of the main categories of benefits from environmental regulations, especially uh, air quality regulations, are reduced mortality risks. Um, so I'll, st I'll start by talking about what the VSL is and what it's not. I'm going to argue that the VSL is, is not what a lot of people think it is. Um, and if properly understood, it's not morally objectionable um, in principle in itself. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm usually bad at humor, but this is, this is going great. <laughs> um, and th then I'll talk about the life cycle consumption framework as an alternative approach for evaluating health and environmental policies. Um, I think this approach has some positive and normative advantages. On the positive side, it can help us improve our benefit transfers. It can help give theoretical guidance to statistical inferences we make about how much people are willing to pay for um, health risk changes. And it can help us evaluate mortality and morbidity risks simultaneously. On, on the normative uh, side, um, the, the advantages on the normative side, I think, all stem from the fact that the life cycle models built on an explicit lifetime utility function, which means it can provide a more basic foundation for a social welfare analysis than, than can the VSL or any other direct estimate of willingness to pay. And I'm going to focus mainly on the, the potential advantages of this uh, framework. I think there's, there's plenty of disadvantages and challenges. I'll, 
I'll talk, I'll have a very quick slide on that at the end, and that's pretty much where I'll close. Okay. Um, so I want to start basically with a defense of the VSL, at least by way of clarifying what it really means. Um, what the VSL is, is the marginal rate of substitution between income and mortality risk over a specific time span, typically a year. And this is simply the amount of money an individual would be willing to trade for reduction in mortality risk on the margin. So this is a per unit value, applies to small changes in risk from the current level. Uh, crucially, the VSL is not intended to represent the intrinsic worth of a human life or the willingness to pay by any particular person or the government to prevent or the willingness to accept the cause, the certain death of any other particular person. So obviously the middle term here, statistical, is it intended to signify that we're not talking about lives per se, but rather statistical lives? Um, but what does that mean? I don't think this is immediately clear to most people. It wasn't immediately clear to me when I first uh, encountered this concept, and, and I have some fear that people read the statistical to mean that we've sort of statistically estimated the intrinsic value of life, which would make it seem even worse. <laughs> um, so uh, to properly understand any quantity, I think it's often helpful to uh, look at its dimensions and its measurement units. <laughs> so um, I started as an engineering student, so this goes all the way back to my engineering classes. Um, be straight on your units. So the proper units of the marginal rate of substitution between income and risk could be, for example, dollars per micromort per year per person, where a micromort is a one in one million chance of dying. Um, now, unfortunately, the VSL is typically reported simply in units of dollars, as in the VSL is $6 million. Um, and when, when it's reported this way, the VSL matches the total amount of money that a large group of people would be willing to pay for small reductions in their individual level risks such that we'd expect one fewer death among the group in a year. So one way to think about this is as the sum of the responses among a large group of people to the question, how much would you be willing to pay to reduce your mortality risk this year by one over n, where there's n people in the sample. So really you should think of the units of the VSL as, for example, dollars per micromort per year per million persons, not as dollars per mort per year per person. It's this, this last one often seems to be inferred about the VSL, but this is emphatically not what it's intending to measure. Um, so with that in mind, the VSL does not seem to be morally objectionable in itself. This is merely an attempt to, to summarize our best estimation of the amount of income people are willing to trade for small changes in their mortality risk. They do this in real life on a routine basis. when when they take lower paying but a safer jobs or when they purchase safety devices, fire extinguishers, more crash worthy cars and so forth. Um, now there are real questions about whether the data we use to estimate the VSL always come from situations where it's, it's reasonable to assume that the people understood sufficiently well the risks they're accepting or avoiding. Um, but for the sake of this discussion I'm going to take for granted that if we're careful enough at least we can, we can collect certain types of data that would allow us to properly estimate a VSL as I've to find it here. Um, but I'm still on this slide. So, so the limitations of the VSL that I'm going to focus on here are, are really more pedestrian than that. The, the first problem with the VSL um, is that it's typically used as if a single number is, a, is correct for all cases, no matter the attributes of the people who will be affected by the policy and, and no matter the, the nature of the risk that the policy will reduce. Now, in other areas of benefit cost analysis, we worry a lot about the accuracy of our benefit transfers. Um, but in the case of valuing mortality risk, we seem to be stubbornly clinging to this unit value transfer approach. It's commonly viewed as, as the least accurate approach in other areas, um, even in the face of, of a lot of theoretical and empirical evidence that the VSL may differ over a number of observable demographic and policy dimensions. Um, now, of course, a lot of smart people support this current practice and with good intentions. Uh, the National Academy of Science uh, summarized it like this. They said that for ethical and practical reasons, agencies generally don't adjust willingness to pay estimates they use uh, to reflect these differences in income, wealth, age, health, status, and so forth. A practical reason is a lack of knowledge on how willingness to pay varies over these dimensions. 
um, but ethical and uh, an ethical reason is, is a policy judgment that these differences due to, say, income should not be relevant for policy. So typically an average willingness to pay for the population is used, making no explicit distinction across population groups. Um, my own view on this is that these ethical reasons and policy judgments apply more broadly than to the valuation of mortality risks per se. They're really more about the fundamentals of benefit cost analysis on the whole. And to my mind, transparency and consistency require that these ethical issues be handled openly and, and explicitly rather than obscured in what I think is a compromised benefit cost analysis. But I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, so I'm going to come back to that after I talk about the framework itself and the, and the positive side of the story. Um, so a few nuts and bolts. This is what the life cycle framework typically looks like. It's based on a lifetime utility function that essentially sums the expected flow of utility or well-being over an individual's remaining years, weighted by the probability of surviving to experience those outcomes and, and possibly discounted by an additional subjective pure rate of time preference. So this is a pretty general framework as it's written here. The period utility function, the little u, uh, could depend on any number of factors, including the individual's income, or more generally, the whatever bundle of market and non-market goods and services is consumed in that period, plus the person's health status, plus possibly age itself. So if we've estimated or calibrated the parameters of such a function, we can then use it as an alternative to the VSL to calculate willingness to pay for any policy that would change the expected future time pass of the uh, individual's uh, health status, this uh, bold H vector, and their mortality risk to the M to any other level um, by finding the largest sum of money that the individual could forego under the policy scenario while leaving them, them at least as well off as under the baseline scenario. It's a basic um, textbook definition of compensating variation. So I think there are at least three potential positive advantages of the life cycle framework. Uh, first, as I alluded to earlier, the, the framework can help to improve our extrapolations of previous study results to new policy cases. This is how we do almost every benefit cost analysis. It's not a new study that's conducted. We, we take stuff that's available from the literature and piece it together and apply it to the new case. So I think the framework can um, provide a good way to piece a bunch of different uh, disparate information together in this process. Um, Carrie Smith and colleagues have, have pioneered this approach and they've done some preliminary applications including one that essentially re-estimates the VSO, uh, but a lot more work here can be done. Uh, now of course the life cycle framework is not, not the only way that individual and policy attributes can be accounted for in the benefit transfer process. Another route would be to use a, a more purely statistical a, a regression approach, possibly involving a meta-analysis of results of a bunch of previous studies. Um, to estimate sort of a, a reduced form statistical model relating various demographic and policy variables to people's willingness to pay. So, so the second potential advantage of this framework is that it could serve as a, a sort of informed con convention in the sense of Lamer to help uh, provide theoretical guidance on how to, how to specify the functional form of such statistical models uh, when we're uh, making inferences about their willingness to trade income for risk in different situations. The third advantage, um, perhaps the most practical of all these, is, is a life cycle framework can allow for a unified evaluation of mortality and, and morbidity risk changes. Um, this is always done in sort of an, an awkward way, in my experience at least. And, and of course, this is what qualities are, are designed for, at least for cost effectiveness analysis. Um, and in fact, qualities can, can be thought of as emerging from a, a form of a restricted version of a life cycle model. But the more general framework I'm, I'm talking about here is, is necessarily more flexible. Um, so I'm going to take a, a sort of a detour, quickly run through a simple example that, that's intended to illustrate how the life cycle framework can be used to examine qu quantity and quality of life cha changes at the same time and tie together uh, several different health valuation concepts. So my, in my example, I'm going to assume that the period utility function the flow of utility is the product of the individual's health status in that period and a concave function over consumption in the period. Um, so think of the H here is that uh, zero to one quality scale underlying the typical way that, that qualities are measured. Um, I'm going to also assume that the individual maximizes her expected remaining lifetime utility by smoothing her consumption over time. This is what emerges from some simple versions of the model. but. 
but consumption patterns typically look more complicated than that in real life. But this is just a simple example for illustration. So, so the Y here without a subscript T can be thought of as, as the individual's um, average annual income over her remaining lifetime. So we're, we're thinking of evaluating a generic adverse health condition that'll, that'll change the individual's quality of life uh, starting at a, a level of one down to some lower level H for her remaining years and, and will increase her mortality risks in one or more future years. So her discounted expected remaining life years without the adverse health condition is capital L and with the health condition is the L prime. And um, the ratio of these is the little l, and we can put all this together to um, solve for the willingness to pay to avoid the adverse health condition altogether, which um, lets us relate willingness to pay to this cost of illness measure, which um, sometimes is called the human capital approach, basically just how much you have to pay in treatment costs, and how much you lose due to lost work time, and so forth. Um, and so. What this equation shows is basically that the willingness to pay measure is going to um, be greater than cost of illness in general and by a specific amount based on um, you know, the combined effects of lost quality of life and, and expected remaining life years. And, and, and the main idea is, is just to show that the life cycle framework could be used to quantify this dif difference in specific cases. Um, and of course this has been known for a long time that uh, cost of illness is generally an underestimate it's conventional wisdom by now, um, but actually estimating the size of this is not often done. Um, and if we have estimates of qualities, uh, lost qualities associated with the illness, we can put all of this together in a single expression relating all three of these concepts together. Um, but now we have to also have estimates of the discounted and undiscounted expected remaining life years. Uh, so. A few quick examples. Um, here's uh, this table has three examples. The first example involves a 30-year-old individual diagnosed with an illness, reduces her expected remaining lifespan by two years, qualities by three years, costs a thousand dollars a year in terms of treatment costs and lost wages. Uh, the other two examples involve older individuals, higher observable costs, but lower reductions in remaining lifespans and qualities. All three examples assume the same annual income and the same baseline survival curve. Um, and the, uh, the numbers in the bottom right quadrant of the table give the willingness to pay estimates that emerge from uh, the equation shown on the previous slide. And, and, and all I want you to take from this um, basically is that the willingness to pay estimates can exceed the um, cost of illness um, values by a significant margin up to a factor of seven maybe in the most extreme case here. Um, so this is just one illustration of how the framework can be put to use on practical health valuation problems. Uh, I don't see anyone watching their time really closely, so um, now you got another five minutes. So I'm okay. So I'm going to spend just a minute on this slide. This this may be just um, mainly for for Michael. Uh, <laughs> um, so, so it's kind of a, a further detour. This has to do with the idea of the health wealth trade-off, which is, <laughs> which is based on the observation that wealthier individuals tend to live longer. Um, and this has led some people to recommend that benefit-cost analysis should account for potential increases in mortality risks that could be caused by, caused by the costs of health and safety regulations. Um, but even if we accept the premise of, of the proponents of the health wealth trade-off on its own terms, which, which is basically that wealthy, peop wealthy people tend to be healthier because they spend more of their income on personal health and safety uh, measures, it still doesn't follow that um, benefit cost analysis should be conducted any differently. So the basic idea here is that if people's expenditures on personal health and safety are optimal, um, we typically assume this uh, since when we're doing benefit cost analysis, we, we generally take um, people's revealed preferences seriously, then, then for marginal changes, the health wealth trade-off would not properly appear in a benefit cost analysis. This is, um, so this, this math just shows that a benefit cost analysis that ignores the health wealth trade-off altogether would look exactly the same as one where it was explicitly included. Um, that is, to a first order approximation, the properly estimated aggregate willingness to pay would be the same in either case. And this is uh, just a simple application of the envelope theorem, but 
if someone um, wants to confirm this, I would I would be grateful. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what does that have to do with the life cycle framework? Well, if, if the risk or wealth changes are large enough, then the second order effects could be important. And so this comes back to the main story. The life cycle framework could be used to help determine whether or not the impacts anticipated under the policy scenario are large enough to matter in that sense. And this is something we can't really do with just a marginal measure like the VSO itself. Um, okay, so those are at least some of the potential empirical or, or positive advantages of the framework. I want to uh, move now to what I think are the potential normative advantages of the approach, and, and pretty much everything I have to say on this topic can be summarized in, in the first bullet. Um, the life cycle framework provides a natural foundation for a social welfare function, um, which allows an integrated evaluation of both efficiency and equity. Um, so to appreciate this point, it helps to to uh, recall the basic theater theoretical foundation of benefit cost analysis, which is the, the Caldor Hicks potential compensation test, which goes roughly as if, if those who would gain from a policy change would still gain after fully compensating those who would lose, then the policy represents a potential Pareto improvement and therefore passes the benefit cost test. And the key idea here is that the, the compensation payments referred to in this test are, are purely hypothetical. Um, we know they're not going to occur, so the, the test re relies entirely on a thought experiment involving an outcome that, that we know won't happen. Um, but the advantage of this concept is that it allows a purely positive economic evaluation of, of proposed policies. The economists can honestly say that, that what people are willing to pay for a policy change is in principle observable. We can estimate these quantities, simply sum them to determine whether the policy passes a potential compensation test. So on this justification, benefit cost analysis can be validly described as a purely positive or scientific exercise. Now the disadvantage is that precisely because benefit cost analysis addresses only economic efficiency um, in that potential Pareto improving sense, it, it can't by itself indicate whether a policy is socially desirable on net, assuming that the distribution of willingness to pay has some bearing on social welfare, and that's um, by virtually all normative theories it will. So it's important to understand that passing a benefit cost test is in general neither necessary nor sufficient for a policy to improve social welfare. Um, and I actually think it's, it's sort of ironic that economists often emphasize the purely positive, non-normative nature of benefit cost analy analysis, appealing specifically to this potential compensation test in, a, in an effort to sort of bolster the scientific credentials um, in, uh, of, of benefit cost analysis in the eyes of decision makers. Um, but of course, the more we press the sort of just the facts angle, the more we call to mind the truism that you can't get a not from an is. So even if the objectivity argument about benefit cost analysis does bolster its scientific legitimacy, it simultaneously sort of diminishes its role in helping us, it, uh, helping to indicate sort of the overall social desirability of the policy. Um, any such irony aside, I believe this is the right way to think about benefit cost analysis. Um, by its very design, it tells us only part of the story. I don't think economists should apologize for this. It's an important part of the story. It's just not all of it. Um, but at the same time, I think we should be careful not to overstate the relevance of benefit cost analysis. Sometimes in our defense of benefit cost analysis against its critics, along the lines just mentioned, we may sort of unintentionally leave the impression that, that not only is is that all that benefit cost analysis can say, but, but there's really nothing more um, quantitative or evalu evaluated we can say about the policy. And it's this last impression that I think should be avoided or corrected. So, so Sunstein comes up again. I agree, I think he's put this well. Benefit cost analysis doesn't tell regulators all they need to know, but without it, they'll know too little. Um, and you can flip this around either way. You want to make the emphasis. It's it only goes so far, but it's useful as far as it goes, or, or vice versa. Um, so to come back again to the main thread, to go, to go beyond the traditional positive version of benefit cost analysis requires an explicit social welfare function, which take, takes measures of people's utility or well-being as inputs and returns a, a, a single number indicating the overall social desirability or, or ranking of alternative states of the world. Um, really, I shouldn't say requires a social welfare function, but, but rather can 
only be done in a very transparent and systematic way by use of an explicit function. So what I have in mind here is simply an expanded use of the full body of theoretical welfare economics that, that goes beyond Caldor Hicks. Um, in any case, the key point is that the primary ingredients are individual levels of welfare utility, not willingness to pay, and the life cycle framework is based on the ex an explicit lifetime utility function. So it provides a more natural starting point for such analyses. Um, and I'll also quickly note that, that adding some form of social welfare analysis to our policy evaluation toolkit does not make benefit cost analysis obsolete. Um, in fact, the results of both can can usefully be combined to present the monetized efficiency and equity effects of a policy side by side. Um, so to do this, we'd first basically just do a standard benefit cost analysis, calculate average per capita willingness to pay for the policy. Um, and then we'd use the social welfare function explicitly to calculate a uniform amount of money that if charged to everyone would make social welfare with the policy equal to that without. And then we, and, and that measure captures both the efficiency and equity aspects um, of the policy insofar as both of those are um, written into the social welfare function in the first place. And then we can subtract one from the other if we want to sort of look at both of these aggregate classes of effects in, in monetary terms. Um, so that's basically the end. There's, there's plenty to say about the challenges and limitations of this approach, um, but I wanted to emphasize the potential advantages just to try to, to push the approach onto more people's radar screens. And, and the approach is no panacea, um, but I definitely think it could be put to more good use than has been done to date, especially for applied policy evalu evaluations. Um, so the brief recap, I think the life cycle consumption framework has, has a number of potential advantages over the traditional approach based mainly on a uniform VSL, including improved benefit transfers, theoretical guidance for statistical inferences, an ability to evaluate mortality and morbidity impacts in a unified way and in a less restrictive way than qualities, and a more natural starting point for social welfare analysis, which can supplement traditional benefit cost analysis. Thanks. Thanks very much, Steve. Scott, uh, take it away. Uh, thanks to Ben for uh, putting all this together and asking me to participate in this panel. And uh, thanks to Steve. Uh, definitely an interesting paper, and I've, I've learned a lot. Um, so maybe I'll start by just recapping a little bit of what, yeah, please. Uh, recapping a little bit of what Steve said. Um, and I, the paper starts with kind of a description of the use and I would argue misuse of the value of a statistical life. So among economists, and I'll count Mike as an economist, uh, the concept of the value of a statistical life is wholly uncontroversial. Um, if I told a group of economists I was coming to discuss the philosophical underpinning of, of such a thing, they'd be stunned. Uh, <laughs> because it, it, it exists, every person in this room has used the value of a statistical life in their day-to-day -day life, and so and it, it's kind of odd, and I see some horrified looks. Uh, every person in this room has used the, the value of a statistical life in making decisions, even though it's not thought of that way. And so I think part of what we have is a problem as economists of marketing the concept. Um, if we could market the concept correctly, we wouldn't have had to become economists, probably. <laughs> so we, we've got this issue that there's this wholly uncontroversial thing that everyone in here does and uses in their day-to-day -day life, but it's somehow, because of the way it's implemented, become controversial. And so maybe a question for you guys, the, the deep thinkers in the room, is, is whose fault is that and what, if anything, should we do about it? Um, you know, among economists, we'd be happy to, to keep using the value of statistical life and ignore kind of the debate that, kind of, that rages behind the scenes. Uh, but maybe that's not the appropriate, uh, appropriate response. Um, so I, I think Steve did a, a really important thing when he started the paper with kind of explaining how economists view the value of a statistical life, how it should be used, and then sometimes how it's misused. And you know, as an economist who's, who's worked in this area a little bit, that's one of the tricky parts is you, you put a number out there and then it kind of goes into other people's process and you don't really have a lot of control over whether it's applied pr appropriately. So even if the folks at the NCEE are doing a very careful job of of trying to estimate this number and use it in the appropriate way, uh, there's plenty of room for others to take the number and kind of misuse it, misinterpret it. Um, and that's another kind of open question is what, as economists, you know, what responsibility do we have uh, 
for putting out a number that's then misused. Um, so that I think is is a really interesting and important way to start the paper. The the next step is to to describe this model, uh, the life cycle model, um, and maybe I'll just take a second to explain what a life cycle model is. It's something that is, economists have been familiar with for a long time in the 50s, I want to say. An, econo an economist named Modigliani won the Nobel Prize for looking at how the life cycle influences spending and consumption. So a life cycle is just something where we think individuals exhibit a pattern. So Modigliani's work was on consumption and saving. People tend to save, to overconsume in their youth and, and take on debt. Then they save throughout their earning years and then they dissave into retirement, right? And so that's an observable pattern that repeats itself across people. Um, so that's one type of life cycle. And Steve is, is calling on another type of life cycle, which is there's kind of an observable pattern in the way people view risk. And, and that changes over time. So I think he, he mentions in the paper that the willingness to pay for risk is an upside down shape U. It starts off low in the early years and in middle age it's at its highest point. And as you, as you get older it tends to decrease. Um, and so I think potentially an interesting thing to kind of implement into this paper is there's a, a big literature now on the economics of happiness. Um, and people actually find that the happiness is U-shaped. So people tend to be at their happiest in, in childhood, in their early years, and be getting progressively less happy into middle age. Yeah, they have kids is what happens. <laughs> That's empirically confirmed. Uh, and so then... In their later years, they become more and more happy. And so we've got this interesting thing where your willingness to pay for risk is moving in one direction, and your willingness to, and your happiness is moving in another direction. That's not completely intuitive to me, and it's not <laughs> something I've thought a great deal about. But I think, I think that the life cycle framework actually gives us an opportunity to kind of bring these two contradictory results on their face together, which I think could be kind of cool. Um, and so. That's the, that's the type of model, the type of framework that Steve's going to work in, and he's going to implement a utility function that includes three things. It includes income, very standard. It includes uh, mortality risk, fairly standard, at least in, in thinking about the value of statistical life. But then it also includes health, and I think that's the, the neat application here. That third parameter in the utility function is something that not a lot of folks have done, and that's what's going to allow him to think about mortality and morbidity in the same framework which is a big advance, as, as he kind of alluded to in his talk. When we do a cost-benefit analysis, the huge majority of the benefits tend to be value of a statistical life. And so if you take a, a project that would, say, reduce morbidity but not save any lives, it's going to have relatively small measured benefits. And it's not really clear to me as an empiricist whether that's accurate or whether we just don't have a very good picture of the value of morbidity. Um, I, I don't have a stance on that because I'm, I don't have the data to, to evaluate it. But what Steve is, is moving us towards is a framework where we can answer those sort of questions. So I think so. the EPA just released a new cost-benefit analysis of the Clean Air Act. And the f total fraction of benefits that come from statistical lives is something like 90%. Um, it's a huge fraction. So this is driving a lot of the, the cost-benefit framework. Um, it's not really clear whether we want it to do that or not. That's, and so using this type of approach is going to let us start to think about that, which I think is a really neat and useful application. Uh, the health wealth trade-off, I was glad he spent a, a few minutes on that because that's a very uh, technical issue. But I think that's actually one of the most interesting things in the paper, and I think that could be its own paper potentially, um, is this idea. So some... I'll categorize them as opponents of, of the size of the v value of a statistical life. People who think we're overestimating benefits say, if you take away some money from me, I'm going to be poor. I'm not going to be able to invest in visits to the doctor, vitamins, and all the things that make us healthy. And so it might be that things that regulations that improve health but cost money, we're overstating their benefits. Um, and I think he's got a really nice, simple high school math type application that shows us that that, in fact, is not the case if you assume that people are optimizing um, across the health wealth trade-off, which, you know, economists take as given. So I think that's a really cool and useful or result that I would definitely encourage you to push further because that could be its own paper for sure. Um, then the equity issues piece, which in a sense is almost freestanding from the, from the life cycle piece. There's the, the life cycle model, which I think is really cool, and then he says, and we can stick this into the equity debate, which is a lot of what I think folks are going to be talking about here today. 
Uh, I think everyone agrees that having a single value of a statistical life is misleading. Uh, the question is what should we do about it? So we observe in the data that it values across at least two, or the value of a statistical life varies across at least two dimensions. The person who's taking the risk and the type of risk. And so if you think about that, you could build a huge matrix of the value of statistical life. Um, I have one value that I'm willing to pay to avoid the risk of getting cancer, and another value that I'm willing to pay to avoid, what's an awful way to die, ax murders, right? And so <laughs> the question is, how far do we go in, in kind of differentiating all these fine micro risk? And there's another point where we could use cost-benefit analysis, right? There's a cost to conducting a new study for each of these things, and it's not clear how big that difference is. And so there's a, an avenue here to say, for each of these types of risk, do we need to conduct a new study? Well, in the cost-benefit framework, it gives us a, an avenue to think about whether we need this new data. How likely is this new data to provide me with a considerably different value of a statistical life? And how hard will it be to, to come up with that number? Um, and so this is a little bit of what this framework, the life cycle framework that he laid out earlier in the paper, is going to be able to give us. It's going to be able to tell us you know, how big a difference in the value of statistical life do we need here to, to change our policy recommendations, say. Um, and I think that would be really cool because that's the, that's the piece we need to know whether we need to go out and do more studies or do a straight benefit transfer, take the seven or nine million dollars or whatever the number is and apply it into this study. Um, he also alluded to the ethical and practical reasons. So the, this is well beyond my area of expertise, but I think the, the practical reasons in particular, I think, say there's a lot of, having one number is obviously incorrect, but having a lot of incorrect numbers is no better. And so there, this practical piece here, as the empirical economist who might be asked to kind of come up with these numbers, the practical piece is big. So let's not forget as we spend the day kind of discussing the ethical piece, there's a big practical component here and it, it's really hard. And these guys at the NCEE have been asked to essentially do the impossible, which is value all these different risk across all these different people and give us the correct answer. That's just not something we have the data to do. Um, and so they have, a, they have a big task in front of them. And, and so I feel like a lot of times they're getting hammered on the ethical issues or some of the other issues about the value of statistical life, ignoring the fact there's a big practical problem here. We might be asking more of them than the data can provide. Um, and so let's, let's be cognizant of that. Um, in, in the paper he proposes using a social welfare function to kind of aggregate up all the efficiency and equity issues in one place in a single number, which I think is a very cool and useful idea, but it's also going to be really data intensive. There's going to have to be some assumptions on the parameter values of the utility function, things like that. Uh, there's going to be a big lift there. And so one approach that might get you part of the way there is to use equity weighting. And uh, Scott Farrow has written a series of papers where he uses equity weighting. And so if you're not familiar with the two approaches, you can think of the social welfare function is on the back end. The economist who's kind of calculating these numbers has to make all the assumptions, has to do all this work, and then there's a single number that kind of is put out of it. The equity weighting comes on the, on the front end, I guess I'm saying those two, right. is that backwards, yeah. The, the equity weighting comes on the user side, let's say. And so the equity weighting means that the person who's consuming these numbers is going to have to make a decision about how they want to make trade-offs between, say, the relatively rich, rich and relatively poor. And Scott Farrow uses the, uh, in some of his work, he uses the distribution of, of tax rates to kind of get a sense of what type of equity trade-offs people are willing to make. And so the social welfare function pushes it back onto the guys at the National Center for Environmental Economics to make some really big and difficult decisions. The equity weighting maybe pushes that onto the consumers of these numbers in the agencies a little bit. Uh, and obviously so for the environmental stuff, that'll come back to, in, it all comes back to NCC. <laughs> NCEE eventually. But I think the equity rating framework is a little potentially more intuitive and the assumptions are a little more out front. Um, and so I think that might be a nice way to take this approach and, and kind of get to an equity piece. Not quite as, as nice and sexy as the social welfare function, but maybe fewer assumptions and so there might be some benefits there. Uh, but Steve's written an ex outstanding paper. I definitely recommend everybody take a look at it. Um, that's a good question. I actually think um, 
I mean, part of my motivation for this whole thing was based on the idea that uh, an explicit social welfare function ha necessarily has to make these things uh, transparent. Um, as long as this, um, there's always a danger of all of that sort of work being buried in an appendix somewhere and not uh, explained in, uh, when the results are presented to the decision makers, and I would, uh, that would be very much against uh, standard best practices. And the same kind of problem happens with benefit cost analysis as it is. You just get a sort of table, a sh small table of final numbers, and um, you hope that the decision makers read all of the stuff that goes into that. And so there's a big challenge of writing the report in such a way that as much of that, uh, as much of the raw information is, is conveyed along with the final results. So um, that would uh, remain true in this case. I think um, some of the, some of What's happened with the VSL is um, some compromises, uh, standard practices, and how it's being used are sort of an attempt to take account of equity issues, but um, it's certainly not transparent how much of that is in there. Um, so I think doing a, a textbook, um, a by the book benefit cost analysis on the one hand, um, and, and emphasizing um, more clearly what that exactly means, and then doing the rest of the equity stuff transparently in a, in a separate step um, would be an improvement that's that's my that's my claim and so I do I do think I guess the most useful thing about at least um, in this version of how the analysis should be done um, one of the most useful things about Caldor Hicks is it does draw a, a neat clean line between the, the positive and normative stuff um, so that's my response Um, I don't think that's the way it should be done. I mean, my, maybe my last quick slide was too misleading. It was trying to show how you could, um, if you have a social welfare function that you think does capture at least some of the important equity aspects of the problem, um, that doesn't, that's probably not going to be done by taking some willingness to pay values about, well, it could be. I mean, I, I guess I could imagine how that might be done, but it may not be done by asking people how much they're willing to pay for different distributions of income or something. Um, but if you do have such a function, um, uh, maybe just based on you know some first principles of of how our social welfare function should behave, you know, I'm thinking of an axiomatic approach that can help you narrow down at least a uh, small set of functional forms that that makes sense given your uh, ethical principles, um, you can then um, back out of that dollar values that compare, uh, that are sort of comparable to the dollar values um, that we usually see in benefit cost analysis that just capture the, the efficiency the component of it. Dollar values for the equity. Well, but it, it comes out of it. It's not an input. It's an output in, this, in the, the way I'm telling the story. Somewhere. Well, the, um, <laughs> Uh, they come from, you know, for example, the social welfare function might say we want to place equal weight on um, uh, the welfare of different individuals, not their willingness to pay. You know, that's the simplest version. And, and so if you start with that as, a, as an axiom, um, you get a, uh, y and, and you add some other specific ethical assumptions, you might come up with this specific functional form for the social welfare function and there was nowhere in that process did you have to ask anyone how much they're willing to pay for equity. It's only at the end when you back out the, do the dollar value of the equity component. Um, I think that's another uh, ad advantage of, of the structural approach in general. It doesn't have to look like the doesn't, the life cycle model doesn't have to look exactly like that, but having s some structural model that does um, has a specific place for pure time preference that, and if you're doing the positive analysis, trying to estimate as accurately as possible what people are willing to pay, and you want to allow that to be non-zero if that's what the data tells you. Um, then if you have enough data to isolate that well enough and you do want to impose this extra normative condition on the, on the back end, you, you know exactly what number to subtract from that and you can proceed as follows. Yeah, I think that the normative 
stuff that I'm talking about, adding on top of the positive analysis, uh, would a lot of that would come into the how this social welfare function specified in its shape and whether how separable or not it is. Um, and I don't, I don't know enough about the right way to do that to say a lot about it. I was kind of trying to stop just before I got to that point, but some um, that's where we need to go, I think, to. Um, to, to do more than we typically do in benefit cost analysis. I have some um, uh, partially informed opinions about what makes sense, at least as first steps, but um, I don't have, I, I wouldn't push them on the audience. <laughs>clarify at the beginning about how the VSL, I think, is often misunderstood. It's sort of um, assumed to be the latter, where we've extrapolated linearly all the way up to a risk change of one in a year, as if you're certain to die. Um, but that's not what it is. It's really just the slope um, at the origin of that, of that curve, at the baseline conditions. And, and usually when we're applying this, it's um, you know environmental policies that are going to have relatively small changes, small in the sense of um, the changes in air pollution that people are going to be exposed to will have uh, uh, one over 10 to the 4 to 6 or so effect on your uh, mortality risk in any given year. So um, we're, we're, we feel much more comfortable applying it over that small range since that's basically the range over which it's been estimated in wage risk studies, for example. Uh, maybe I'll weigh in on the second piece really, really quickly because it's the same same kind of question. For what we're doing, at least, we're valuing environmental regulation, which means we're trying. The, I think the value we're trying to elicit is how much should everyone be spending. So it's it's a yourself in addition to everyone else, and so we were trying to ignore. It sounds like you might be worried about some free rider problems and things like that. Whose money we're talking about? We're trying to abstract from all that and think about if we're making environmental policy, what value should we be using? And so we're thinking, the, at least the number we're trying to elicit, and I think you could argue about whether we're getting that question phrased properly to get that value, but the, the number we're trying to elicit is how much are you willing to spend of your own money and everyone else's. There, uh, I'll add one more bit to that. One of the um, citations I put up on the second slide is an EPA white paper that was written for our science advisory board to ask them their more expert opinion on a lot of these issues. The altruism one um, was one of the things we asked them about. Um, we kind of just uh, briefly summarized what the literature said about this and kind of at and just said, what sh should this affect the way we estimate the VSL, which studies we use and combine? And, um, and there's the, the second citation was their draft response to our question, so that might be a good place to look for answers to that. Uh, I'm not sure if I can an really <laughs> answer the question, um, but it does remind me that um, some, some uh, economists are doing work, um, CV type studies, uh, stated preference studies, asking people how much they're willing to pay for policies that will reduce risk to themselves and a certain number of other people by certain amounts and, um, and varying the incidence of the costs and the benefits and uh, trying to see if there's something systematically different uh, that come out of responses to those types of surveys than ones that just focus, try to focus on their own risk reductions themselves. So that's sort of a first um, attempt to try to bring some of people's preferences about distribution and equity into the actual estimates of willingness to pay. So, um, but I'm not sure if they uh, suffer from the, the problem that you're highlighting or not because I'm only vaguely aware of those studies, but that's where to look for that, I guess. I'm definitely s uh, sympathetic to the idea that um, sort of uh, in an in a ideal world, um, we could have this separation of 
powers among agencies where some can just focus on efficiency stuff as, and we have this other arm that then adjusts taxes and transfers to um, spread the, the benefits as, as equitably as, as possible. Um, I think that's almost as fictitious as just the standard pretend it's, it can be uh, transferred um, easily uh, after the fact. So I don't find it as, I don't find it 100% compelling or maybe only 10% or so. I guess okay. if I can put a number on it. Because the, other, the other agency that would be doing that we would call Congress. <laughs> so maybe less than 10%. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thanks very much to Steve and Scott. And really hopeful.